Welcome back. In this web lecture, we're going to finish up our discussion of animal sensory systems by considering two of the other sort of large classifications of important sensory structures, photoreception, that is responsible for the sense of vision, and chemoreception, which is the detection of various chemical molecules in the environment for various reasons. So just wanted to bring back to your mind the scenario that we started out with of the moths out looking for mates and being detected by bats using all of these different kinds of sensory modalities. So in the last web lecture, we talked quite a lot about hearing and other mechanoreception uh, that the bat is using to be able to use this echolocation to detect the moths. In this web lecture, again, we're going to talk about um, a sensory modality that doesn't play a big role in this particular scenario, uh, vision. Remember, this is all happening in very low light conditions, uh, but also this very elaborate uh, chemoreception system that the male moth has to be able to detect even very distant females using these elaborate brush-like antennae. So let's first start to think about photoreception of vision. So animals use a diverse set of different kinds of organs for vision, for light reception, but the underlying mechanism for capturing light is pretty much the same, and this suggests a common evolutionary origin for these different light-sensing organs. So the organs involved in photoreception range from very simple sort of little pigment spots that can detect light, and we call these eye spots, all the way up to very sophisticated image-forming eyes that can de detect very fine uh, distinctions in, in images. A species' sensory abilities are going to correlate with the environment it lives in and its mode of life. life. So this is another example of this form-following function. Natural selection is going to favor structures that are necessary for an animal to survive in its environment. And so there's going to be this very strong correlation between structure and function. So for example, a salamander that lives in forests or meadows will have complex image-forming eyes, whereas those that live in lightless caves may have no functional eyes at all. So in terms of natural selection, we can think of this situation where these eyeless salamanders living in caves evolved from species that did have vision, but then when the occasional mutation came about that compromised the function of this visual system, it didn't have any negative impact on the, on the organism, and so those kinds of mutations are able to accumulate in the species because they don't cause any harm, and you end up with a degenerate eyes. So let's look at the evolution of visual perception. So light detectors in the animal kingdom range as we said in the last slide, from very simple clusters of cells that detect the direction and intensity of light. So these are not going to form any kind of image, but they're going to know if light is present or absent to very, very acute eyes, such as the compound eyes of this dragonfly that form very distinct images. Light detectors all contain photoreceptors, cells that contain light-absorbing pigment molecules. So this is very similar to the pigments used by plants to absorb light. And most invertebrates have some kind of light-detecting organ. So again, one of the very simplest light-detecting organs is that of the planarians. This is a kind of invertebrate flatworm, a very tiny organism that has these little eye spots. And so a pair of ocelli called eye spots are located near the head kind of make them look kind of funny and cross-eyed, um, but they're basically just very simple pigmented cells. And these allow the planarians to detect when light is present, and their response to detecting light is basically to move away from it to a more shaded area. The idea is that whatever is causing the shade is going to also offer the flatworm some protection against predators. Now let's take a look at the eyes that we find in insects and actually a lot of other uh, species of arthropods. So insects have a compound eye composed of many light-sensing columns called omatidia. So omatidia are each of these little individual functional units and the compound eye. 
Uh, insects, in many cases, have excellent color vision, and some can even see into the ultraviolet range. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about color perception. And each Almatidium has an individual lens, so there are a bunch of lenses that are going to focus light onto a very small number of receptor cells, so usually about four per Almatidium. And so each of these little lenses are going to focus the light, and those receptor cells are going to send axons into the brain to communicate that signal. So each omnitidium is going to contribute information about one small piece of the visual field. You can think of this as being like a single pixel on your computer screen. Each one of these is going to have just a very small part of the whole picture. Therefore, a compound eye with more omnitidia has a higher resolution or ability to distinguish objects. Remember, the more pixels you have on your computer screen, the better the resolution, the better you're going to be able to distinguish uh, fine details in an image. And also, species with compound eyes are particularly good at detecting movement. Now let's think about simple eyes, or what your book refers to as single lens eyes. So among invertebrates, single lens eyes are found in some jellies and polychaete worms, as well as spiders and many mollusks, such as the octopus eye that you're seeing over here and in an anatomical drawing down here below. So they work on a camera-like principle. There's an iris that changes the diameter of the pupil to control how much light enters. So the iris is this colored portion here that can get larger or smaller or increase or decrease the size of this opening the pupil to let more or less light in. And the eyes of all vertebrates are of this single lens type. And if we're thinking about vertebrates, the eye detects color and light, but it's actually the brain that assembles the information and puts it together to perceive an image. So basically, what we see with our eyes is just color and light. It's your brain that actually forms the image. So let's take a look at the anatomy of the vertebrate eye. The outermost layer is a protective covering um, of tough white tissue called the sclera. So this is the white of the eye, and so this is going to be this protective tough coat around the eye. The front of the sclera forms the cornea. So this is a transparent sheet of connective tissue. Just inside the cornea is a pigmented round muscle called the iris. So we can see it pictured here, and then this is, of course, the part of the eye that's responsible for your eye color. And the iris can contract or expand to control the amount of light entering the pupil. So this pupil, it looks like the pupil changes size, but it's actually the iris that is going to sort of contract away from it or relax down into it to change the amount of light that enters. So again, the hole in the center of the iris is the pupil, and that's what's going to admit light into the eye. So light enters the eye through the cornea, so it's gonna pass straight through this clear connective tissue, then passes through the pupil, and then a curved, clear lens right behind the pupil. In front of the lens, there's a clear and watery um, substance called the aqueous humor. So there's a fluid-filled compartment in front of the lens. And then there's a jelly-like compartment behind the lens called the vitreous humor. All of this is transparent. The light passes right through it. Together, the cornea and lens focus incoming light onto the retina in the back of the eye. So this is this layer around the back surface of the eye. The retina contains a layer of photoreceptors and several layers of neurons. So here's an image of that retina in the back wall of the eye. The retina is attached to the rest of the eye by a single layer of pigmented cells. So here's that pigmented epithelium with the receptors poking into it. And the retina itself is composed th of three distinct cell layers that synapse together. So first are the photoreceptors themselves. These are the rods and cones. More about them as we go. Um, these are the receptor cells that are actually going to respond to light, and they're held in place by the pigmented epithelium. So this is at the very back wall of the eye. An intermediate layer of connecting neurons called bipolar cells are going to receive the light signals from those receptor cells and transmit them to a third layer of ganglion cells. So they form the innermost layer of the retina and their axons are going to travel together into a big bundle and project to the brain via the optic nerve. So here's the optic nerve 
that's going to the brain, leaving the back of the eye here, and it's composed of all of these axons from all of these ganglion cells going all the way around. So this area where the optic nerve leaves is a region called the optic disc, and so because this is where the optic nerve is, there are no photoreceptors in this little spot. So there's this spot in your eye that actually does not detect any light. It's kind of a blind spot. We're generally not aware of it because we use our two eyes with overlapping fields of vision and the one eye fills in the blind spot for the other eye. So now let's take a look at the function of these rods and cones. So photoreceptors in the vertebrate eye consist of rods and cones that differ in both structure and function. So rods are sensitive to dim light, but not to color. So this is our rod here. Cones are much less sensitive to faint light, but are stimulated by different wavelengths of color. So it's the cones that give us our color vision. So this explains why night vision is largely black and white. At night, rods do most of the work. They're not detecting color, but they're very sensitive to very dim light. It takes a lot um, stronger light to activate these cones. So mostly what we're using for night vision are the rods. Rods and cones have segments packed with membrane-rich discs that contain large quantities of a transmembrane protein called opsin. So if we look here at our rotting cone, we can see these regions here that look like they have these little stacks of discs. Here is a micrograph of one of these. You can see these folds of membrane, and in these membranes, they're packed with these intermembrane proteins that you're seeing here. So this large intermembrane protein is called an opsin. Each opsin molecule is associated with a molecule of the pigment retinol. So this is this little black and white model here inside of the retinol pigment that is closely associated with the opsin. And so in rod cells, this two molecule complex is known as rhodopsin. So this whole thing, including the associated pigment protein of retinol is called rhodopsin. So how do rods and cones detect light? So it has to do with this retinol pigment protein. So retinol changes shape when it absorbs a photon of light, leading to a change in opsin's conformation. Going way back to the very beginning of the course, if you'll remember when we were talking about saturated versus unsaturated fatty acid, we introduced you to this idea of cis and trans isomers, these structural isomers, and basically one of these carbon-carbon double bonds is just flipped and reversed in the inactive version as compared to the active version. You can see how in the inactive version around this double bond you've got hydrogen and hydrogen on the same side, and this one you've got hydrogen and a methyl group on the same side. So it's changing the shape of that molecule. So specifically, this is the number 11 carbon in the retinol molecule changes from the cis to the trans conformation. So this is the cis conformation, and this is the trans. So retinol works much like a light switch. So this should remind you of the phytochromes that we saw when we were looking at plants' responses to red and far red light. Unlike the case with plants where one kind of light switches it one way, the other kind of light switches it back. In the case of retinol, light changes its shape, and then just after a certain amount of time, it's converted back to its original state. It doesn't have to be exposed to another kind of light to switch back. So in vertebrates, the molecular basis of vision is this shape change in retinol. This change in shape closes ion channels and decreases the amount of neurotransmitter being released to the sensory neuron. So this seems a little bit backwards in terms of the different sensory systems and neural transmission that we've been talking about before. So it's a little bit of a strange bird. In rod cells, electrical activity across the membrane as well as neurotransmitter release are maximized in the dark. So the default state is to have sodium channels open and a flow of sodium that's depolarizing the receptor cells continuously as long as light is not present. When retinol has not been activated by light, sodium channels in the rod's plasma membrane are open and entry of sodium continually depolarizes these rod cells. So exposure to light transmits information by inhibiting both of these processes. So the depolarization of the rod cells and the release of neurotransmitter. So now let's take a look at how this light signal is transduced into an electrical signal 
in the nervous system. So transduction of visual information to the nervous system begins when light induces the conversion of cis-retinol to transretinol. So what we're looking at right here is what's going on in the dark when this cell is not activated. So this is a rod cell. This is the cell membrane of the rod. And this is one of those disc structures, those membranous discs that we saw a couple of slides ago with that transmembrane protein rhodopsin embedded in it. And in the dark, the molecule cyclic GMP binds to sodium ion channels and keeps them open. So remember, the default state is going to be for open sodium channels to continuously depolarize the membrane of the rod cells. When retinol is transformed by receiving a photon of light to the trans version of retinol, that's going to activate this transmembrane protein, rhodopsin, which is going to activate a G protein, if you remember your cell signaling, these G protein pathways. And the activation of the G protein is eventually going to lead to hydrolysis of cyclic GMP. So let's take a look at how that works. So now we're looking at a similar figure when light is present. So rhodopsin activates the membrane protein transducin that we see down here, which in turn is going to activate the enzyme phosphodiesterase, PDE. So here is our activated phosphodiesterase. And this is going to be the enzyme that breaks down this nucleotide cyclic GMP into GMP, guanosine monophosphate. So when the cyclic GMP is converted to GMP, it no longer binds with the sodium ion channel, and that allows the ion channel to close, and that is going to hyperpolarize the cell. The signal transduction pathway usually shuts off again as enzymes convert retinol back to the cis form. So remember, it doesn't need to receive a different wavelength of light like what we saw in the phytochromes. Normal enzymatic activity is going to convert retinol back. So let's take a look at what this would look like in terms of membrane potential over here. So in the dark, in this depolarized state, the membrane potential is going to be sort of steadily around negative 40 millivolts, and the neurotransmitter glutamate is going to be released by the photoreceptor. So here is our rod cell in the dark, sodium channels are open, the rod is depolarized, and this glutamate is released to the bipolar cell, which is the first neuron in line in this chain of neural signaling from the retina. When that rod is exposed to light, so the light strikes the retina, there's going to be a hyperpolarization of that membrane due to the deactivation of cyclic GMP that's going to stop interacting with that sodium ion channel and allow that membrane to hyperpolarize. We see it dropping down to negative 70 millivolts. And what that's gonna do is that hyperpolarized membrane is no longer going to release glutamate to the bipolar cell. And the effect of glutamate on the bipolar cell, and the transmission of that signal, is going to depend on the sensitivity of any particular bipolar cell. So in the case of the dark response, the bipolar cell can be either depolarized or hyperpolarized depending on what kind of glutamate receptors it has, whether it has glutamate receptors that are going to activate sodium, potassium, or chloride channels. And same thing for the light response. It depends on what kind of glutamate receptors are present in that particular bipolar cell, what the response is going to be. But in either case, the reaction to light, the response to light, is going to be some kind of change in the polarization of these bipolar cells. So when light strikes the rods and cones, they hyperpolarize, shutting off their release of glutamate, and that's going to cause some kind of change in the signaling of these bipolar cells, indicating that light has been received. So we mentioned briefly in the last web lecture that not all of the integration necessarily happens within the central nervous system. Some part of integrating this information can actually occur as soon as that stimulus is received. So we're gonna see now some of the ways that processing of this visual information begins in the retina before it's transmitted through to the central nervous system. So one of these cases is something called lateral inhibition. 
If you look at this figure from your book, these photoreceptors are going to have communications not just with these bipolar cells, but also with these other communicating cells called horizontal cells, which are going to communicate with other distant, more distant photoreceptors. So lateral inhibition is when a rod or cone stimulates a horizontal cell, and the horizontal cell then inhibits more distant photoreceptors and bipolar cells. So it's going to make different communications. Here it is communicating with a bipolar cell. Here it is communicating with one of these photoreceptors. It's going to influence how photoreceptors um, at a distance are responding to that light. So in this way, regions receiving light can appear lighter and dark surroundings can appear even darker. And this is going to improve the contrast of an image and allow you to see greater detail in that image. A single ganglion is going to receive information from an array of rods and cones. So here we have, remember, the ganglion cells are the ones that are going to join all their axons together and travel to the brain by way of the optic nerve. And so together, the rods and cones that are feeding information to a single ganglion cell are going to define a receptive field, so some part of the visual field. And a smaller receptive field, again, you can think of this as being a single pixel on your computer. Having a larger number of smaller receptive fields typically results in greater resolution, a sharper image. So this is another way that some of this integration and processing occurs at the level of the retina. So now let's think about color vision and how color vision comes about. So it comes about because there are different versions of these opsin proteins uh, in the cones. So color vision results from three different cone types, each having a different type of opsin. So these opsins respond only to distinct wavelengths and thus are called blue, green, and red opsins. Again, this is very similar to the different uh, pigment molecules that we saw in plants that are responsive to particular wavelengths of light. The current theory holds that the brain distinguishes color by integrating the signals from the three types of opsins. So you can think of the brain using combinations of signals from these different kinds of cones and blending them together, sort of like you would blend paint together to be able to detect all of the fine gradations of color that we're able to see. So earlier ideas about color vision um, were a little bit off the mark. So in the late 18th century, physicist John Dalton suggested a mechanism for his red-green color blindness. He realized in his early adulthood that he and his brothers did not see color in the same way other people did. And he hypothesized that his eyes contained a bluish fluid rather than a clear fluid, which caused no red wavelengths to reach his eyes. Clearly this proved to be incorrect, but it was at the time uh, a reasonable hypothesis based on what we knew about how light behaves at the time. And actually after his death, he left instructions that his eyeballs were to be examined to see if in fact the fluid inside them was blue, but it turned out that it had a slight yellowish color, which is typical of older individuals. So we now know that abnormal color vision results from mutations in the genes for one or more opsin proteins. So here is an example of a picture with lots of colors as seen with normal color vision, and then a version of the same image with red-green color blindness, uh, the inability to distinguish red from green. All of the reds and greens kind of appear brownish. So how do other animals see color? Do they do it in the same way that we do? So among vertebrates, most fishes, amphibians, and reptiles, including birds, have fairly good color vision. Humans and other primates are among the minority of mammals with the ability to see color very well. So this has to do with an evolutionary history of fruit eating and needing the ability to visually determine whether fruits uh, are ripe by their color. So animals that are active at night have relatively few cone cells. Cone cells don't do them much good when trying to see at night, and many, many rods, giving them very high sensitivity to low light but very poor color vision. Many other vertebrates and invertebrates have four or more different types of opsins and probably perceive a world of colors that's much richer than ours. So here's some examples of variation in visual systems. A marine fish called the coelacanth lives in very deep water and has two opsins that both respond to wavelengths in the blue region of the spectrum. 
So this is an advantage to visualizing the only color of light that penetrates to that depth, which is blue light. Blue light penetrates more deeply than any of the other wavelengths, and so it's able to see the light that um, is present in its environment. So as I mentioned before, primates that eat fruit can distinguish between green, yellow, and red in order to find ripe fruit, and so have opsins sensitive to those wavelengths. Some insects and birds have opsins sensitive to ultraviolet light, so beyond our visual range in the, in the purple direction, which can serve as pollination signals in flowers. So here we have a flower as we would see it, and the same flower with a filter that allows us to see this in the ultraviolet range, and so this is what a bee would see, so it can very clearly see the center where the nectar is gonna be located. The flower is directing the bee to that region so that the bee can get some of its pollen onto its feet and coat and deliver that pollen to the next flower. So this is a signal that's specific to organisms that can see in this ultraviolet range. Another example of this is in birds. Birds may have uh, plumage that are intended to send a signal to other potential mates of the same species, but if they have lots of bright and gaudy colors that just anybody could see could attract the attention of predators. So this is a very clever evolutionary solution to have evolved both the ability to see in ultraviolet light and also plumage that is visible in that range so that other organisms that have ultraviolet vision can see them, but organisms that don't see in that range will not see these, these color patterns. So now let's think about the whole distribution of these photoreceptor cells that together are going to work together to create a whole visual field. The brain processes visual information and controls what information is captured. So we can do this consciously by focusing our eyes on particular parts of the visual field. And this occurs by physically changing the shape of the lens for Near vision, this lens is going to be thicker and rounder due to the muscular activity acting on it. And for distance vision, the lens will be flatter and thinner to focus on distant objects. And again, this is under voluntary muscular control. We can choose what we want to focus on. There's a structure in the retina called the fovea, which is the center of the visual field. And in humans, this center, this fovea, contains no rods, but a very high density of cones. So when we really want to distinguish something in high light, we basically want to focus our eyes so that light is concentrated on this area with maximum color vision. So with increasing distance on the retina from this fovea, so as you go farther, farther away from it, the number of cones decreases and the number of rods increases. You may have heard when you're looking at the night sky that if you want to see sort of a dim star or planet, that it's actually better to focus your eyes a little distance away from that so that you can be able to see it more clearly with these rods that are more sensitive to, to dim light, and that's the reason. You're not gonna be able to see it at all if you're focusing it on your, on your fovea. Now let's turn and think about chemoreception. So the senses of taste and smell rely on similar sets of sensory receptors. So if we're thinking about terrestrial animals, we think of the sense of taste as being dependent on the detection of chemicals called tastants. So this is going to be dissolved chemicals that are, are dissolved in the, in the saliva in our mouths, and we call this taste. Olfaction is dependent on the detection of odorant molecules. These are going to be molecules that are sort of loose in the air, volatile chemicals that are present in the air rather than dissolved in liquid. In aquatic animals, there's actually no distinction between taste and smell. It's all just the detection of chemicals that are in the, in the surrounding water. Taste receptors of insects can be located in sensory hairs located on their feet and in their mouth parts. So for example, this fly, if it's crawling across your kitchen counter, is actually using its feet as it walks along to detect that little drop of juice that didn't get wiped up. And then once it detects that sugary juice on the counter, then it can use its mouth parts to sort of lick up those sugar molecules um, to feed on. In humans and other mammals, there are five 
taste perceptions. And we call these sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. So this is the sort of um, meaty, savory taste that's elicited by the amino acid glutamate. So researchers have identified receptors for all five tastes. So there are separate receptors for each kind of taste. So here we have a taste bud on the tongue with a bunch of different kinds of receptors coming into the same uh, taste bud and it's going to be sensitive to whatever molecules are coming and binding with the particular receptors there. So experiments show that an individual taste cell expresses one receptor type and detects one of these five tastes. So within this individual taste bud, there are a whole bunch of different cells. Each one of them is sensitive to only one type of taste. Receptor cells for taste in mammals are modified epithelial cells organized into these structures called taste buds, located in several areas of the tongue and mouth. So there are these little volcano-like bumps with pits in them located on the tongue. So most taste buds are associated with projections called papillae. So that's the kind of volcano structure with a little bit of a mound with a pit in the center. Any region with taste buds can detect any of the five types of taste. So if you are familiar with this kind of tongue map that shows you which parts of your tongue are sensitive to the different kinds of taste, so if you want to really taste something that's sweet, you should taste it with the tip of your tongue. This has been summarily debunked by science. Uh, this kind of tongue map does not have any basis in reality. Any region with taste buds can detect any of these five types of taste. Researchers who analyzed the membrane proteins in taste cells found strong evidence that salt and sour sensations result from the activity of ion channels. This makes a lot of sense, right? Salty tastes come from sodium chloride. You would suspect that sodium channels are involved somehow. So the sensation of saltiness is primarily a result of sodium dissolved in food, which flow into the taste cells through open sodium channels and depolarize that cell membrane directly. So the perception of salty tastes is through direct movement of sodium through these channels and depolarizing that cell directly. So remember that sourness is an indication of acidity. So it's gonna result from the presence of hydrogen ions, otherwise known as protons, that flow into the taste cells through hydrogen ion channels and also depolarize the membrane. Remember, if we're bringing in positive charges, that's going to depolarize the membrane. So also, sourness is going to be a matter of depolarizing that membrane directly through the presence of those ions that are there in the food. So for example, the sour taste of grapefruit results from the release of protons from citric acid when it's dissolved in water. So a lot of different molecules can be perceived as a bitter taste. So why, why do we get this bitterness from so many different kinds of molecules? So researchers recently identified a family of 40 to 80 genes that encodes transmembrane receptor proteins, each of which binds to just one particular type of bitter molecule. So basically, for all of these different molecules that are perceived as bitter, we have an individual receptor with an individual gene that codes for that receptor that's going to detect that particular molecule. And a taste cell can have many different receptor proteins, which explains why so many different molecules give rise to the sensation of bitterness. So bitter receptors may have evolved in response to natural selection for avoiding toxic molecules. If you think about the way plants defend themselves, it's basically by producing toxins or other noxious chemicals um, and they're going to evolve different kinds of, of chemicals that are going to have this noxious or toxic effect. And so animals respond by being able to detect those kinds of molecules and have kind of a common response to them. You get it in your mouth, it tastes better, you spit it out. So what about sweetness and umami? So in humans and mice, there are three closely related membrane receptors that are responsible for detecting sweetness as well as glutamate. And so remember that that glutamate receptor is responsible for that sensation called umami, which is the meaty taste of the molecule mono monosodium glutamate or MSG that is commonly found as a flavor enhancer, uh, particularly in many Asian foods. Glutamate is sensed by one particular pair of the three receptor proteins 
while sweetness is sensed by a different pair. So if you think of these three receptor molecules, two of them together are going to sense glutamate, a different pair of the three are going to be used to sense sweetness. And it turns out that a variety of different molecules can all stimulate the same sweet receptor cell. So there's going to be a common region on these different molecules that can bind to that receptor cell and cause that perception of sweetness. Now let's think about the sense of smell. Olfaction allows animals to monitor airborne molecules that convey information about food and the activities of prey and other members of their own species. So when odorants or odor molecules reach the nose, they diffuse and dissolve in a mucus layer on the roof of the nose. So if we think of the odor molecules coming in through a human nose, they're gonna diffuse up into the very top of this nasal cavity, and they're gonna dissolve in this mucus layer up in the roof. And there, they're going to bind to membrane-bound receptor proteins that are going to activate olfactory receptor neurons. Axons from these neurons are going to project up into the olfactory bulb, so this is a little plate of bone, a very thin plate of bone that separates the top of the nasal cavity here. Here's that bone from the brain cavity. This is the actual brain sitting here right on top of that bone. So this is a portion of the brain this is projecting into. And those receptor cells are going right through the base of the skull down into the nasal cavity where they have their endings and they're going to detect those odorant molecules dissolved in the mucus. So this is going to be a region of the brain called the olfactory bulb. And this is the part of the brain where olfactory signals are processed and interpreted. So initially, investigators hypothesized that olfaction was kind of similar to gustation in that there are receptors that res respond to a small set of kind of fundamental basic odors that are each going to be detected by its own type of receptor. So this hypothesis was not supported when a pair of scientists, Linda Buck and Rachel Axel, did experiments in which they discovered a large gene family and lots of different genes that encode these different receptor proteins on those, on those olfactory receptor neurons, so on the receptor cells. And so there's a very, very large number of these receptors that are going to be sensitive to different kinds of chemicals. And so we find that there are a lot of differences in the sensitivity to smell, and kind of the extreme case is that of bloodhounds that have the strongest sense of smell of any dog because they have many different functional receptor protein types, so a lot of different kinds of these genes for different kinds of receptor proteins that are each that are going to be sensitive to different molecules. And they also have millions and millions of these olfactory cells, so a high density of these receptor cells spread over a very large surface area. So the large number of different uh, functional receptor proteins means that they're sensitive to find distinctions between different kinds of molecules that they're detecting, and the large number of them means that they can detect a very small amount of that chemical signal in the environment. So it's going to be both extremely sensitive and extremely discerning. So each olfactory neuron has only one type of receptor and neurons with the same type of receptor project into distinct regions called glomeruli in the olfactory bulb. So every axon of every neuron that has a particular, that's sensitive to a particular chemical is all gonna be routed to the same place in the brain. Follow-up work uh, after finding this gene family indicated that particular smells um, in experiments with mice are associated with the activation of a certain subset of the 2,000 or so glomeruli, or these regions in the brain, that all detect a distinct uh, molecule. So this suggests that it is the particular combination of receptors that are activated that are going to give you the exact smell that you're smelling. Rather than being more like the sense of taste, where you have distinct receptors and each one is going to just detect a a single taste. The sense of smell is more similar to the visual system where you have just the three different kinds of receptors and the brain is going to blend the, the signals from those three receptors together to get all of the different shades of color that we see. But obviously with 
2,000 different inputs. This is on a much larger scale. We can discern millions of distinct odors. So odorant receptors have been discovered in other areas of the vertebrate body, um, such as tissues of the heart and pancreas. So these are detecting chemicals, not in a way that's going to be perceived as taste or smell, but so that the body can keep track of where different chemicals are in the body to maintain homeostasis. And also, it's recently been discovered that sperm cells contain odorant receptors that aid in fertilization. So they're going to detect chemicals in the uh, reproductive tract of females that help them find the egg and aid in fertilization. Finally, let's take a look at a special case of olfaction, the uh, signals that are sent called pheromones. So pheromones are going to send signals to members of the same species to give information. So let's go back to that question we started with about how male moths are able to locate female moths from miles away using these chemical signals. So the answer lies in the antennae of the male, which can detect a chemical released by the female in very, very low concentrations. So pheromones are chemicals that are secreted into the environment and cause some kind of physiological or behavioral change in members of the same species. So this moth pheromone um, was actually the very first pheromone that was discovered. And in tetrapod vertebrates, there are pheromone receptors that are localized in something called the vomeronasal organ. They're sensory organs that are in the nasal region. They're distinct from the olfactory bulb, so this is not going to directly activate the sense of smell. So the vomeronasal organ and the olfactory bulb send signals to different parts of the brain, although some animals sense odorant molecules with their vomeronasal organ, but they would not necessarily perceive that as a smell. Those molecules would trigger some kind of change in their physiology or behavior. So example, a male snake may use its vomeronasal organ to follow a pheromone trail of a female snake. So using it uh, specifically as, as a pheromone, uh, communication from a member of the same species, or it could also use that chemosensory structure, the vomeronasal organ, to track um, a prey item by their scent trail. So there's some overlap in these um, sensory modalities, but again, remember stimulating different parts of the brain. So this wraps up our discussion of the sort of nervous system side of animals' response to their environment. So we've gone through how signals are transmitted through the nervous system, through action potentials, the mechanisms by which those action potentials are generated. We've taken a look at several sensory systems and how information from the internal and external environment is converted or transduced into these electrical signals that are being transmitted all through the nervous system. In the next couple of sections, we're going to wrap up the semester by thinking about this other mechanism of communication through a large body size, this communication through the bloodstream by way of these molecules called hormones that are going to communicate with receptors in particular tissues to coordinate responses and also to maintain homeostasis.